Welcome in, folks, to another great episode of I've Got a Theory. I'm your host, Tanish Polko. I'm excited to be joined by Brandon Sweeney. Brandon, thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. So Brandon uh, has several mutual friends with me, and so that's how we got connected. But he's a serial entrepreneur, five-plus businesses, uh, mostly in the health and wellness industry. Uh, you're also a recovering attorney. And uh, we like talking about drinking whiskey and or kava, as we found out before potentially futurely Kava, but, um, as we found out before in the pre-show. So welcome on to the show. Let's talk about some stuff. Sounds awesome. Thank you. Well, Brandon, so um, you, you mentioned that you've got a theory and I want to kind of dive into it because I thought it was a relevant one and it's worth sharing and it's good to spread the awareness of what you were thinking about. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about, tell me about your theory and why it's important. Sure, sure. So as I was thinking about your podcast, I was thinking about what do I wish what is the theory I wish I had um, kind of formulated earlier in my career that would have helped me uh, a lot at this point? And like you said, I'm a recovering attorney. And I remember my first day in law school. Um, uh, the professor said, how many of you guys think that the admissions county council made a mistake and then you got in as a mistake? And I looked around the room and about 75% of people raised their hands. And I found out that this was the case. I went to Vanderbilt, but this is the case also at Harvard, Stanford, Yale. And it's something called the imposter syndrome. And basically, have you ever heard of this, the imposter syndrome? Roughly, yeah. It's kind of along the lines of fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah. So it's this basic idea that um, fake it till you make it is, is how you get around the imposter <clears throat> syndrome. Uh, but the imposter syndrome is, is basically this idea that uh, you are faking it, right? And that sooner or later, somebody's gonna figure out that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I guess for me, the theory that I'd like to you know, presuppose on your, on your show is that most of us are just kind of making it up as we go along. Um, that the people that are so-called experts out there, oftentimes, not all the times, but oftentimes are just kind of confident guessers who might have a little bit more experience but they are confidently guessing. And it's something that I wish I would have known earlier because I was one of those guys that had a ton of ambition, worked hard uh, all the time, you know, 24 seven. But I always thought, okay, I need to get better before I jump in the water. You know, my first, my first six businesses were franchises. So the, the playbook was already there for me, right? I just needed to work hard. I needed to um, find funding and then uh, manage these, these six franchises. And um, my dream was to get into my own business earlier, but I thought, okay, I've got to figure out all the answers here. And there's got to be the answers out there. I got to figure out how to do all of these things before I venture out and try my own thing. And um, Working with those franchises and then meeting people that were had been very successful um, multiple times over, and people that were in huge leadership positions, I found out that there's just a bunch of bullshit out there. And a lot of the times, people that are in these leadership positions are just very confident, and they might have great experience, um, but oftentimes they're they're just pretty confident with what they're doing and a lot of people follow along. So I'm not saying to your listeners that you should just always fake it until you make it, but I do think that you should jump in before you think you're ready. You know, I, I had this conversation just recently with, and I'm in the real estate world, <clears throat> and uh, you, get, you get the extremes of everything. Like, oh, I love pretty houses and showing houses, and I could be a real estate agent, which is a, a factor that's important to do it, uh, but you also have to be able to be diligent with paperwork and work on negotiation and understand pricing and how numbers work and financing. And it's useful to have all those skills or at least know the right person to go to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those things like it's, it's scary to do it, but the real thing in real estate isn't showing pretty houses. It's lead generating. It's can you get a client to sign with you, Right. And people don't think about that with real estate. And so it's the same thing with a lot of businesses, right? I love this Peter Drucker quote that I heard years ago that I kind of live by, which is there's only two purposes to business, which is innovation and marketing, right? Do something better than someone else 
and then tell people that you do something better than someone else, right? And get them to sign up for your product or your service or your coaching or buy something from you or whatever it is. And so um, it, it does take some practice, I think, to kind of get there. But I, I, I was definitely there as well, where for the first 10 years of my professional career, I was on payroll from some, for some other company before I started my own company for the first time in 2014. Um, so it took a while uh, before I felt like I knew what I was doing. And I had some stumbles in the past too, where I was like, okay, I think I'm ready. Let's try it. And then I'd try it for six or nine months and then feel miserably like crap. I need to go get a job again. Right. And so I would try, but it, it but it is tough, right? You kind of have to fake it. And then you, you realize what you're in the business of but at the end of the day, every business is, can you get clients? Can you, can you sell something? Right. And that's a lot of it. Um, and people forget that. Right. And so uh, especially in the real estate world, I see a lot of agents saying, oh, I need to get my social media page up and my website. I'm like, none of that matters if people aren't even going to look at you as a, as a potential business partner. 100%. And, you know, real estate and in my business, um, I own fitness clubs. Um, and I just recently started my own fitness club that I'm sure we'll talk about in a second. But um, our businesses kind of lend themselves to the fake it till you make it. Other things like being a doctor, a physicist, an engineer, you can't really fake it till you make it. But, you know, with that being said, you can go to two Ivy League doctors for the same illness and oftentimes they'll give you different prescriptions. They'll diagnose you differently. So uh, a lot of this stuff is, isn't natural law. It's not like it exists out there in its pure form. It is how, how we go about doing these things. Um, and I love that Peter Drucker quote, uh, innovation and marketing. So I guess jumping off that, I would say that as I get older, I, f I find that the marketing component is even more important uh, than innovation. Um, at least in small or medium-sized biz businesses, you can be a genius, but if nobody's going to buy your product, it's, it's pointless, right? Sure. You know, and it's funny, we, we, it, it, I couldn't help but think of Catch Me If You Can and Leonardo DiCaprio movie where he does mm -hmm. fake everything, right? He fakes being, he passes the bar legitimately, he was smart enough to yeah. do that, but he fakes being a doctor, he fakes being a pilot, he fakes all these different things and gets away with it for so long, right? Until at the end, we know how the movie ends, is that he then works for the FBI to catch other imposters or fake check casters or things like that that are kind of doing this because he's good at it. And that became his specialty, right? He's kind of the red team weak force to figure out when people are faking it or cheating the system somehow. <laughs> That's a great example, actually. Um, uh, I'd add on to the, the legal side. Uh, my first year out of law school, during law school, I, I summered, uh, which means basically you got an internship between your quarters um, in civil litigation. But my first year out of law school, I was in criminal law. And law school, for the folks that are listening that, that aren't familiar with law school, um, from the outside, it seems like you're just learning all these rules, when in reality, each state has their own codified rules and they, they vary. Law school is pretty much just a PhD in philosophy. So when I first got out and I started practicing criminal law, I thought, okay, I'm just going to be more diligent at you know, studying the constitution and searching for loopholes for my, my, my clients. In reality, what I learned very quickly is that, um, you know, it totally depends on your relationship with the judge and these soft factors that uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It's not the innovation side, right? I'm trying to innovate an argument. The marketing side of how I position myself to the judge was way more important. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, this theory is that, that, that we all assume that there's these rules to the game when in reality, uh, there's so many different ways to go about it. Um, and the factors and you you're considering might not be relevant or, or they're, they're, they're different factors than what you considered. So a lot of times, yeah, you know, if we're going into the, the conversation of how to start your own business, the things that you think you need for your, to start your own business may be completely different than what someone experienced in that business would tell you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, even in my space, I, I, I've, as an attorney, I've, I've helped a lot of other fitness companies start up, and the way they go about it is completely different than than I went about it. But they still find a foothold. They still, you know, to this day, survive the pandemic, and they're successful. And um, 
yeah, like there's multiple ways to skin a cat. So, so you, you know, the basis of the theory is that people that, that, that act like they know what they're talking about just have a lot more confidence, but it's also, they might have a little bit of experience in seeing what they're doing and, and overcoming, you know, the challenges that go along with executing that successfully. And, and fortunately, I've been working hard to position myself around other entrepreneurs and successful people as advisors and mentors to me. And one, one thing I've noticed about most of them is that they're humble enough to keep learning, right? They never, they like the guys that I like to surround myself are always like inquisitive. They ask questions, they, they, you know, they dig into it before they come out like the raging bull. Like, I know what I'm doing and everyone get out of my way because I'm smart and I'm rich. Like, you know, that, that doesn't go over well with a lot of people on the other side of that argument. Oh God, I, I completely agree. And the, the folks that, um, that I'm most impressed by now uh, uh, are the, the people that are humble enough to say, I don't know what I don't know, but here's what I do know. And I'm yeah. fairly confident in this way. Um, when, you know, a decade ago in my 20s, I would have said, this person that seems just so confident in what they're saying, um, that's the source of, of, you know, that's who I should be trying to learn from. And you, you find out pretty quickly as you stumble along and you make a lot of mistakes yourself that there's no way that this person knows all these answers because that's assuming there is one right answer when in reality there's there's a lot of different ways to go about doing these things. I mean, you look at the, the people that are most relevant for us in business, the people that I look up to like Elon Musk. I mean, he defied every rule. Um, and because of that, he was successful, right? Um, I mean, I think he, his Tesla's now worth uh, more than all of like our domestic car companies together. And and it, anybody who would have watched his rise would have said, this isn't going to last. It's just not right. going to happen. This is a really stupid idea. Um, uh, he's not going about it the right way. And for those reasons, exactly, he he's now so successful. Yeah. I mean, it, it did take a huge gamble there. And everyone advised him. No, you can't start a car company. Are you crazy? No, you can't start a space company. Are you crazy? You know, like all these things that they told him were impossible. He's like, I'm just going to do it and you'll see. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's yeah. also kind of on the, on the rare side of the spectrum, literally, you know, partially since he's got Asperger's and partially because he <laughs> has that genius intellect to be able to figure out engineering and finance and space travel and all these crazy things that, no regular human could, could, could match, um, I, I would argue. Well, so, you know, Brandon, you know, let's talk about being normal people. And tell me about your business. You, you started this boxing company and I'm assuming you had some interest in that area before you dove into it. Um, and, and uh, you know, what, what was the advice that you got and how did you determine that you're going to start a company like that? Sure. So while I was in law school, um, my wife, uh, Got an opportunity to open what was the sixth pure bar pure bar is a it's a franchise now but it's kind of like pilates sure. um so open the first pure bar in seattle which was the sixth pure bar nationwide now there's over 600 or 550 but she got that opportunity and um she opened a second one right after that uh she took on a ownership with with her dad um, and he seeded the money and it wasn't a lot of money at all. Uh, cause these things were, were, uh, not expensive to build out, but, uh, I came back and those companies started to take off. In fact, she was making more money than me. And it seemed like there was a lot of room for growth, but there was just no way that she could handle it. So I said, I didn't love my job that much. I didn't love, um, criminal law. I love business law a lot more, but, uh, I jumped off of law with the intention of doing it for one year, helping her open two more studios, get them managed, kind of get them uh, to a point where she could scale up and, and sit back a little bit and you know not manage the day-to-day -day operations, but kind of manage just the business. And found out really quickly that uh, I love it and that um, that's where I should be. And from there, uh, those four that we had were, were successful. They were doing well. And we opened an additional two and we had a staff of uh, about 115 people at the time uh, with six, yeah, six studios. And uh, 
we had, um, I want to say like 20,000, 25,000 people on our mailing list and um, they were doing really well. And uh, like anything, you know, you, you learn the ropes and you, you figure out that, okay, I want to, I want to leave the house. I want to jump into my own thing. And uh, we saw some problems with the franchise model, mostly that we had to give away a substantial amount of our money back to somebody that at a certain point wasn't really, um, we didn't feel like they were providing a lot of value. So uh, we started a couple companies along the way. One of them was a challenge company. Um, and what we did is we saw kind of this, this unaddressed problem where uh, folks wanted to get ready for like weddings or for their 20th high school reunion, or they wanted a definitive start and stop time um, to, to lose a certain amount of weight or gain a certain amount of muscle. Kind they of really like yeah. Exactly, exactly. And people are competitive, especially here in Seattle, I'm sure in San Diego, you got a competitive 25 to 45 year old demographic there that they love the idea of a challenge. So we, um, we started it locally where we, we put them on this thing called a Stike U, which takes a 3D model of their, their body and then we do this thing called an in-body, which tells them how much fat they have, how much muscle they have, water weight and all that. And that gives us a, a basis point. And then we do three months of nutrition and they work out at our facilities. And then there's a cash prize winner at the end. But they, they end up being walking advertisements for us too, because um, you know the competitive behavior really manifests in like big changes for these individuals. Um, and so we rolled that out here and it became really popular for all the franchises. And uh, so we had- um, That was for the Peter Bar as well, you talking about? Or yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, got it, yeah. Yeah, so we, we, it was called Sports One Reset. We bolted it onto the side of our business and then we had about 170 Pure Bars uh, buying this kind of additional add-on for their business. Um, the franchisor didn't like that very much because they could have been making that revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So they kind of made their own um, company and they gave it to the franchisors for free. Uh, so we, we jumped out of that, um, but it was it was a solid run, made, made really good money for a while there. And then uh, I started boxing after a CrossFit injury and found out that I was just absolutely in love with this. It, it felt like not just working out, but kind of like high school sports where I was learning a skill with the intention of like jumping in the ring with somebody at some day or just getting better at, at something instead of just push-ups, you know? Sure. Um, and fell in love with it. Um, and I brought my wife because I wanted to show her like she's a hardcore workout person. I wanted to show her what this is all about. And she just hated the club. It was, you know, a bunch of guys with tons of testosterone, place smelled like shit, um, yep. dirty, you know, your classic yep. kind of boxing club. Someplace Rocky and, would be proud of. Exactly, exactly. The place like that has the, you know, the the posters on the walls that are kind of like half coming off. And um, <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe uh, this is down the forte up there. Yeah. It, you got a exactly. good bag, but, but it's not too clean. Right, right. Um, and at our, at our point with our franchises, I mean, 70% of the people that were working out were, were women. And that's pretty consistent across the whole US. And so I thought to myself, back in like 2014, 2015, this boxing club is missing that entire, they're missing the money right there. Yeah. Um, so I thought, why can we make a boxing place that's really upscale, um, a place that the focus isn't on getting into the ring with somebody else, but on just burning calories right. and, uh, and training and learning a skill that, for me, it burns a ton of calories, but it's a lot more fun than just, you know, jumping on a treadmill. Yeah, sure. And so I, I did this uh, uh, this graduate school course work um, at Stanford B School and their design school. And you had to pick a business um, that was kind of germane to your field. Um, so I said, why don't I just do boxing, half boxing, half weightlifting? And we track everything because Orange Theory had come out and wearables was huge. Um, sure. And uh, that's where Rowdy Box was born. Um, and 
this goes back to, to my theory, I was too scared to, to pull the trigger on it. So I had this idea back in 2016, um, completed six courses, uh, proposing this idea, developing it, polishing it up, um, and I was just too scared to pull the trigger. Well, um, in 2018, this company called Rumble Boxing out of uh, New York, um, they opened and it's pretty much the exact same concepts I had thought of. Uh, they did a little bit better than, than I had thought of. Um, but yeah, now it's a $600 million company and they've got locations all over the country. And when I saw them open, it was the, that was the bridge for me to say, okay, this can work. And, and that's how Rowdy Box was born. Yeah. So yeah, so, so you're, so you got proof of concept from your wife's experience, but also from this competitive competing business. But now you're saying, Hey, I could do that too. Let's tweak it and make it my own. Exactly. Exactly. And I wish I would have uh, trusted myself. And instead of waiting for all the right answers, I would have said, you know, I can, I can jump in here. I can make a couple pivots. I can figure this out, but what I have is, is good enough to, to start. Um, but I so had to wait. Know, how many locations you have? Are you, are you outside of Seattle yet? Where, how's your business expanded? Yeah. So we had the good fortune of, um, opening in April of last year. So uh, smack dab during the pandemic, um, uh, because of some non-compete stuff, we couldn't open, uh, Rowdy Box near, um, our pure bar studios. So mm -hmm. we started the build out and the build out was about a year and we, we started the build out about four months before the pandemic hit. Um, so we've only been open since January of, of this year, uh, oh, wow. technically. Um, but we had this large expansion plan. We we're gonna use the funds that we got from selling off these franchises. Um, but we went a year of paying really expensive rent in downtown Seattle, right next to Amazon. Um, and so it's put things a little, it's delayed things quite, quite a bit, but uh, sure. we still are looking for space um, right now in other cities um, close to us uh, with the hope of, of putting another spot up or at least signing another lease before the end of the year. So what's been the feedback from your members so far? Because you know I've seen some of the pictures and stuff, it looks like they're having fun. Yeah, yeah, the feedback has been uh, pretty awesome. We've had to pivot a few times though, for sure, especially because of uh, the pandemic and because of Seattle's response to the pandemic. but. Uh, the feedback has been uh, pretty great. Our our concept is half fight club, half nightclub. So you do the boxing classes in a, um, a club that we had designed by a guy that does EDM shows in Germany. So there's um, changing lights. Our bags are not your conventional kind of heavy bags. They're a little easier on the, the wrists and the knuckles. They're water bags called aqua bags. Uh, we have customized benches where everybody can grab their own weights and use their own weights. So 50% of the time you're lifting weights, 50% of the time you're, you're boxing. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a huge education component that we've had to get around, which is, Hey, this isn't your normal boxing club, but the response has been, the response has been pretty awesome. Um, uh, it took us about five months to make a profit, but I think we're one of the few fitness companies in the area right now that is is growing, which is so great. It's kind of you know to kind of wrap up. What you know, what's your advice to you know people that are on the fence about being an entrepreneur or starting a business that that you could share that might compel someone to get off their hands? Yeah, yeah. So a couple of things. If you if you are um, <clears throat> if you have an idea and. Uh, you're, you're just sitting there waiting for the right time to jump in. Um, Hennish, you've got kids. Uh, when's the right time to have kids? <laughs> it's, it's like never, right? It's never going to be an easy time to have kids. Um, and uh, that's the same thing with starting a business. There's not, there's not going to be any perfect time. It, there's not going to be any time to you know, time the market for the stock market. Uh, you just got to trust that if you do fail, you're going to learn a lot from that failure. Um, but that you don't have to have all the answers before you start and before you get in. Uh, yeah, sometimes I, I know there's this, this um, concept in Silicon Valley, fail fast, which I don't know if I, I trust 
you know, that, especially if you're using your own money and not private equity money. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you don't need to have all the answers before you, uh, you start a business. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to you do have to kind of figure it out. And it was interesting. And I know you listened to Jeff Fenster's uh, episode of I've Got a Theory with me about how his, he, he didn't have plans and goals. His, he just had kind of like a Kaizen type mentality of making it 1% better every day. And just tries to tweak and accomplish micro goals every day and just move it forward and just move it forward one foot at a time, which was really interesting that he didn't have it structured and dialed in. But, you know, as same to your point, a lot of the, the best pros don't have it dialed in. They don't have the one month, two month, three month, four month plan. That it's like, all right, let's make it a little bit better every month. And if a pandemic hits, we have to fight through that, then we will, because if you had a detailed timeline, it would have been thrown off anyways. Absolutely. Absolutely. These goals are great in theory, just like a, making a pro forma income statement for the next five years. It's so pointless. <laughs> uh, so I really liked that podcast because of that Kaizen principle of uh, setting these micro goals, getting just 1% better and letting that compound over time. Um, otherwise, it can be overwhelming. Yeah, for sure. If you're like, oh, I need to get all these things. Yeah, you don't want to set yourself up to fail. But at the same point, you shouldn't celebrate those micro wins that you have hit, the win stacking and things like that that he said. I was like, yeah, that's good. You should feel good about those things and just focus on that, not the one thing that could have gone wrong along the way. Think about the five things you did right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Maybe celebrate with, you know, a glass of kava and and move <laughs> on from there. But but yeah, if, if you don't um if if you don't look at the the small wins, um you know, you're always looking forward and never enjoying the present too. So yeah, exactly. I mean, because otherwise it can seem it seem like you'll never be satisfied. And I, I've talked about that in other shows, is that if you're always looking for happiness or looking for success, it, it makes it gives you the impression that you're currently not happy or not successful. When you could be both of those, you just have to recognize it and take the moment to appreciate that. Couldn't agree more. Well, Brandon, hey, I appreciate you jumping on the show and, and sharing so much with me. And I, and I really want to see how your uh, business grows, especially if you get down to San Diego and I get to punch some water bags around. <laughs> There's some business people on here and it's cool. It's a cool idea. And I know that these, this innovation that's happening in these different fields is important because we haven't thought of it all yet. Things keep evolving. Preferences keep evolving. And people, the, what they want to do and how they want to do it and what they enjoy out of it is changing. And if it isn't for innovation and entrepreneurs to bring that to light, it doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if uh, you're you sound like you're in a couple of different kinds of businesses here, and um, I mean, before the show, you were talking about how you have a, a, a real estate company, right? And right. yet you um, you have somebody doing uh, uh, your landscaping because you realize, like, yeah, I, I don't know how to to do that side of it, and um, uh, and uh, Anyway, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but what I what I was trying to say is that uh, we don't have all the answers out there. Um, just because you're in a certain that's where I was going. Just because you're in a certain area um, doesn't mean that, that this area is exhausted of all of the innovation that can happen in it. And you can keep searching and and keep pivoting and um, kind of you know keep looking out for new ways to do things. Um, and just because somebody is so called an expert in that area doesn't mean that they've thought of everything and that you should trust them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they might be better than you today, but hopefully in a week or two or a month or something, you could learn and get a little bit better. Absolutely, yeah. Awesome. Hey, Brandon, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some some wisdom with us uh, and uh, you know sharing some of your experience from running a, running a few different businesses and, and learning from that and, and then the guts that it takes to do so. So it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for joining me again on another great episode of I've Got a Theory. Uh, we'll catch you on the next show. Thanks so much. Thanks. Take care.